morning, the series name is Matters of the Heart. Matters of the Heart. We just got finished with a, uh, with a series that, <clears throat> that said that um, this, uh, it was uh, where we're wanting to change. People that really want to change life. They want their ch lives better, more equipped. We taught about that, how God wants us to change more than then we want to change. Actually, we're built to change. The way we're created is a change. In fact, the, the change can be so elaborate, we're the only ones that in existence that can become brand new creations in change. What an incredible, incredible thing. Amen? God is brilliant. So praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and start out in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we open up the word of the living God, we thank you that you'll speak to us, Lord. You'll speak to us of, of eternal things, of big kingdom business, Lord God. You'll share with us, Father, issues that'll, that'll change our lives and cause us to grow and mature, that the blessings and inheritance that we've received in your kingdom comes to pass in our life, Lord. I don't want to go to heaven and see everything I missed. I want to go there and have you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You, you enter into the joy of the Lord. So, Father, in Jesus' name, let the anointing move in every heart and every life. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. Whatever you need to do, however you need to do it, we're yours. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen and amen. Well, the scripture I'm going to start out with this morning is found in Second Timothy, the third chapter, and the first five verses. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Matter of fact, read it with me. The first verse says this. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Now, you know, throughout history there's always difficult times. Um, that's, not a, that's not news, right? Um, doesn't matter what generation, doesn't matter what people, what country, what nation, what social group you're in, there's going to be difficult times, isn't there? But this is a little bit unique because it isn't talking so much about catastrophe, national disasters, catastrophes in that way that, that cause the problem. There will be. Jesus talked to us about that in Matthew 12, right? Uh, he said that, uh, that there will be um, uh, great stressful times with perplexity. And that word perplexity means there ain't no way out of it. And um, uh, so we're seeing this, though. Uh, he says there's going to be difficult times. The word difficult in another translation is perilous. Um, uh, it also means insane. It means destructive. It means in a rage. So th there's going to be very difficult, perilous, insane, destructive, and rageful times. And boy, why aren't we seeing that? Man, people out in the streets and I used to, you know, I travel a lot of third world nations and when I'd get into uh, uh, some of the uh, nations where, um, uh, especially of Islam, uh, they would, uh, they, if anyone would, like say in the United States, somebody would, I don't know, tear up a, a, a Koran. In their own nation, they would burn their own cars and they would loot their own stores. I always thought, what? What in the world is going on here? You're mad, so you're going to destroy your own stuff. You're going to wreak havoc on your own civilization here? But it's a spirit. And that's what he's saying here. You know this, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. I always used to say, praise the Lord, it ain't like that in the United States. But lo and behold, uh, last year proved me wrong. It showed up here. At where they burnt down our own towns, they, they say, let's defund the police, right? They're like, that's going to keep crime away. Uh, that's the insane they're talking about. It's insane times. I think I used the word insane more last year than I have all my life up until then. Uh, just terrible, terrible stuff going on. Foolishness, right? But he says, know it. In the last days, there's going to be perilous, difficult, insane, destructive, rageful times. Let's start reading with the second verse again. Why is this? Now, it's, again, it's not because of national disasters, natural disasters, I should say. It's not because of, you know, just, uh, like, just terrible, terrible storms or volcano eruptions or, or, or uh, earthquakes. But look at what it says. Read it. For people will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, 
disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They'll be reckless, puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious, but they're going to reject the power that could make them godly. Read it, stay away from people like that, right? It, it, it's contagious, isn't it? <clears throat> because we know whatever seeds, we're a garden. God created us as a garden. He created, <clears throat> he created the earth, and, uh, 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 and he created man out of soil. Um, he created the earth, which is called the, the soil. The ground is called Adama in the Hebrew. And the word for man, the, not the gender, the race, man. We're all man. Some are male men and some are female men. That's all there is, by the way, male men and female men. And um, uh, he created this, and uh, uh, he called them Adam. Our race is called Adam. And that is the root of Adama. We've been created from the soil, and so we have the ability to produce what's been sown into us. That's why it says, don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. So we, there, there's potential in our lives for incredible things. There's potential in our lives for phenomenal things, but there's also the same potential for terrible things, wicked things. Uh, things that will bind you, people up to cause them to be oppressed and depressed and just very hateful and mean and vicious. So we have to guard our lives, don't we? We have to guard what's that's what he said. He said, stay away from people like this. Unloving, unforgiving, you know, they're disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, scoffing at God, boastful, proud. They're slandering other people. They don't have any self-control in their life. They're cruel and they hate what's good. And they only point out the bad, in other words. They'll betray their friends. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride. They'll love having pleasure in this world more than they love God. It says they'll act religious, but they're going to reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And that's, that's the key. The key is understanding that we have to protect our lives. Amen? We have to protect our lives. None of these, again, are natural disasters. Every one of them is a problem of the heart. Every single one of them is a problem in a person's own heart. is isn't somebody made them do that. Nobody made them. It's what they allowed sowed in their heart, and that's what came up. They're eating the fruit of what they allowed in their lives. And they can point, and because they don't understand our makeup, they don't understand how God has built and created everything. And so, of course, they point their fingers. It's the job's fault. You know, I'd be, I'd be nicer to you, honey, at home when I get home, but the job. No, it's what you sowed in your heart is coming up. That's the fruit you're eating. Oh, I'd be nicer to you children, but, you know, we're just having financial problems at home. No, it's your heart. All the problems in the world have nothing to do with us when we've guarded our heart. When we allow sown into our heart what's going to come up of joy and peace, amen, and love and goodness and righteousness, all that is going to come up. It's seed sown. It isn't our great actions. It isn't the law of just, you've got to do. No, I'm just going to sow into my life and it'll grow. It'll come up. That's what's going to take place. This is God's plan. It was from the beginning. Amen? That's why when Adam sinned, you know, the Lord held up, I don't know if I have it around here again uh, yet, but he held up a, yeah, he held up a package of seeds. And he says, Adam, because you sowed these seeds, this is what's going to happen to you now, bud. Look at, look at the picture of what your life is going to be. And in dying, you'll die. But you know, he died first, how? From his heart. He says, in dying, you'll die. He died first in his heart, and then 900 and whatever, seven years later, he, he, er, he died again, physically. It caught up to him. Death overcame him. 
because of what was allowed in his own heart. <clears throat> See, there's two hearts that everyone has. We have a natural pumping heart and we have a spiritual heart. Two different hearts in every person. Every one of us born into this world is born with a heart that's dead to God. But we have a real heart, and that's why religion is so deceptive. It makes people think that they're right with God, but their heart is far from them. They're doing religious things, they're doing wonderful things, they know scriptures, they, can, they know stories about Jesus, but they, they, their heart isn't one with God. And so the death process is just so severe in their lives. Loneliness, when loneliness grips them, it grips them. I mean, every one of us, even Christians, will feel, you know, uh, uh, lonely a slight bit, I guess, but we sow good things in our hearts. We, we, we're constantly knowledgeable about who we're with. We, we have, we have a, a, a constant companion who talks with us and walks with us and, Right? Leads us. He comforts us. He cares for us. The human heart, most people, they don't pay much attention to it until they have problems with it. That's why not many people really commit their lives wholly to God until their life's a disaster. Right? Then all of a sudden, God, when 9-11, right? Church is packed out. Just packed out. Six months later, nobody was around anymore. He goes, God. But they never gave their heart to him. They just wanted something from him. They don't want that relationship. The human heart, it's, it's, it's a hard-working marvel. As a matter of fact, it's the hardest-working organ you have in your body. It is the hardest working organ you have in your body. It can keep beating automatically even if every other nerve is severed from it. It can still keep beating. It's incredible. In other words, I can, I can produce fruit just me and God, although he never intended it to be just me and him. The best fruit is when I build relationships and some relationships go sour. Some stay pretty good. Some are great. But I continue and I stay faithful. Sowing seeds of goodness. Sowing seeds of, you know, right words, right thoughts, right vision of future, of, of, of what's taking place. And it just, it, it, it causes my life and your life, it causes it, our hearts to get bigger and bigger and bigger before God. In a 70-year lifetime, your natural heart beats on an average of uh, uh, 75 times a minute or 122,400 times a day or 40 million times a year or two and a half billion times in that 70-year lifespan. And boy, isn't that something? Nobody even pays attention to your heart unless it skips a beat. Then all of a sudden, everyone knows they got a heart. Everyone. Whoa, what's going on here? At each beat, the average adult heart discharges four ounces of blood. This amounts to 3,000 gallons a day. Your heart pumps 3,000 gallons of blood a day, or 650,000 gallons of blood a year. That's enough to fill more than 81 tanker cars with 8,000 gallons each, every year. Have you ever seen a, maybe a mechanic use a hydraulic jet, a hoist? You know, you bring your car and lifts a whole car. Well, a heart does enough work to lift, in one hour, to lift a 150 pound man to the top of a three-story building. It has that strength. It has that power. It exerts enough energy in 12 hours to lift 65-ton tanker car one foot off the ground. In 12 hours. It can lift 65 tons a foot. That's huge, isn't it? Or enough power in 70 years to lift the largest battleship 
in the world out of the water. Now, none of us wants our heart to take a day off, right? Or, or even take a lunch break, right, uh, for an hour. It, it, you don't even want it to mi- stop for a minute. Not even a beat. In fact, when it stops a beat, doctors are concerned because they understand the heart. The medical industry understands, so they're concerned. Man, it missed a beat. But most people, even Christians with a new heart, they don't understand why they should protect their heart. And even when all problems take place and issues come, they still don't recognize that it came from their heart. They think somewhere naturally out here it made it happen. But that's not true. Amen? My doctor once said, you got to start doing some cardio. you got to start building, you know, do some cardio. So, you know, I was going to go back to the gym, but I found they moved the, the cardio, you know, spot up to the second floor, and I wasn't going to climb no stairs to go work out. That was... So anyway... Everyone knows how critically important a physical heart is. In fact, hopefully now you know, understand more how critical it is. Physically, watch what you eat, right? Watch what you eat. Put the sweets away. Watch the salt intake, right? All these things. Watch it. Watch how much you eat. Because it all matters to your heart, doesn't it? Well, the same thing holds true to the spiritual heart. Yet, again, most people, they don't understand the importance of working with their spiritual heart to make it stronger and produce better. If we'll, if we'll take care of our spiritual hearts and allow it to grow, it'll, it, it, our heart impacts every area of our life, by the way. It impacts our health. It impacts our social arenas. It impacts our finances. It impacts our mental state, our emotions. It impacts today. It impacts tomorrow. And it impacts the next day and the next year and your future. What you allow in your heart today is going to matter in your future. Why? Because we're a garden. And you might not notice the effect of the seed, but when it comes up, look at what you did, Adam. This is what's going to come up now, buddy. When Adam's heart died, it caused Adam to hide from God in fear. I don't want anything to do with God. Sometimes people say that, oh, I'd go to church, but man, lightning would come down and strike me. You know, They're afraid of God. And he's not to be feared in that way. The word fear, when it's, the Bible says fear God, it means reverence him, respect him. Not be afraid of him. Nobody should ever be afraid of God. Like Nobody should ever be afraid of their father in this world. God isn't a beast. He isn't holding a club over you, and anytime you make a mistake, he's going to bop you on the head. That isn't God. He's there to hold you and help you. He's there to care for you. I remember when the, the religious people came up to Peter and the disciples were there with Jesus and said, Peter, hey, how come you and your, how come your, your master here, how come Jesus doesn't pay temple tax? And he says, oh, we pay it. We, we, we. And Jesus went, Peter, come on. Does the king take taxes from his own son? He says, nonetheless, go fishing. Take, first fish you catch, take the gold coin out of his mouth, give it to him, pay all of our taxes then. He didn't beat Peter. He didn't scold me. He didn't say, look how bad you are. And how... He, what he did was he corrected them to see the way God sees. Right. Here. It, it, look at, the, we, he, he's our provider. He helps. Amen? Our spiritual heart is the centermost part of our being. In fact, our, 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 some places in the Bible will get there down the road here, but it's called the hidden man of the heart. It's almost like we're two different people. You know, the one you see, the suitcase that brought me into this earth, 
and then the one inside of me, the real me. We're either dead to God or alive to God. In fact, Jesus said to the uh, um, he he said to those that refuse to believe in God, he said, "You're your father, the devil." He said, "But I'm of my Father in heaven." He says, "Because you do what your father wants, and I do what my father wants." It seemed pretty harsh. But every one of us were born into this world and didn't ask to come, right? None of us. I didn't say, ooh, 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 take me, God. I want to be there. He, we all came, and he put us into this fallen world, this corrupted world. And all he asks us to do is give us his, or give him our heart. That's it. Just give him our heart. And if we can give him our hearts to him, on it, just continually give it over. Give it, just keep going. Doesn't matter. I got hurt. Here's my heart, Lord. Rather than, look at how hurt my heart is, everybody. And going around, tell, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this. And the seeds that are sown, your heart's going to get worse and worse and worse. But the more our, we learn, we just give our hearts over to God, we find out that we become better and better and better. Amen? The production of your life so far is what you've allowed into your hearts. You can't have anything better in your life unless your heart's changed. It's, it's impossible to have better. You can't have eternal life until you get a new heart, right? It's impossible to have eternal life without a new heart. Think somehow I'll get to heaven. And that's sad, but no. You're separated from God. It has to be a gift from Him to you. You have to be willing to accept a new heart. You can't keep the heart the way you have it and expect somehow you're going to have a greater life. That's like the, somebody said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing the same old way, thinking you'll have different results. You have to do things different to get different results. Well, you have to have a different heart in order to have God results. Amen? This heart is the center of our innermost emotions, our innermost feelings. Our heart is our soul. It's the center of our, uh, the essence of our life, who we are. It's the seat of, of our existence where God communes with us. Or we refuse to commune with him. Everything in our life is determined by our heart. So if we give our heart to God, we have a better life. If we keep our heart from God, our life gets harder and harder and harder. And we strive, just like God told Adam. You're going to toil from the sweat of your brow by, because of doing this, Adam. But he doesn't want that. He wants us to enter into his rest, the place where he does the work. Where his work is finished and we just accept it. We just allow it to grow up in us. Amen? Johnny went to school, first day of school. He's, he's in kindergarten and they're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They're being taught the Pledge of Allegiance. And so the teacher says, well, everyone put their hand on their hearts. And little Johnny puts his hand on his backside. The teacher starts saying the pledge and teach him the pledge and looks over and says, Well, Johnny, no, you, why, aren't you, why isn't your hand on your heart? He says, Well, it's on my heart. He says, Well, no, that's not where your heart is. He says, Yes, every time grandma comes over, she picks me up and pats me there and says, Bless your darling heart. And my grandma don't lie. <laughs> Everything concerning our heart and our life is about seeds. Everything. Everything, everything in your garden is about seeds. Whether weeds come up, it was the seeds that were there. Whether the carrots and beets and whatever else you plant, corn come up, it's because of the seeds that were there. If you want a garden that doesn't produce anything, that you can't really eat, even though you worked at it some, you just let all the weeds grow up and it'll choke everything off. You know what Jesus said? Is it important that we guard our hearts? Yes. It is, isn't it? So everything began with a seed in creation. Look at in Genesis 1, 11 through 12. It says this. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding what? Seed. And fruit yielding 
or tree, fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. In other words, the seed is in itself, he says. Upon the earth it was so, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, if you took an apple seed, and I showed you an apple seed, you probably should have grabbed one. It's too little for you to see from up down there anyway. But if I took a little apple seed, and I said, what do you see here? Most everyone would say, well, that's a seed of some kind. And if you, on close examination, most everyone would say, well, that's, that's an apple seed. But actually, if you understood the seed, you knew it's more than that. See, that little seed is really a tree. That, re that little seed represents hundreds of apples. That little seed represents an orchard. That little seed represents thousands and tens of thousands of apples. That little seed represents jobs. That little seed represents factories. That little seed represents an, uh, an economy that would grow and increase. Everything. God wants everything to increase and it's all by a seed. That's what millionaires and billionaires understand that most folks that just, you know, punch the clock, they, you know, they go to work and peel the banana and roll it in the chocolate and dunk it in the nuts all their life. Not understanding that, that life is a seed. Everything we do is a seed. And if I do it and I do it well, I'm planting, I'm sowing better seeds and fruit is going to come up. Somebody's going to have to take notice one day and cause you to grow cause you to increase in that company, cause you to increase in your life. It's got to take place because it's the principle of the seed. You just have to have faith and patience. That's why the Bible says, through faith and patience we inherit the promises of God. It's through, we just keep doing what's right. And if we do something and it isn't right, then we change it. Because we guard the seeds we're sowing. Amen? Praise God. Number two is everything in this world is done by the principle of what? A seed. Everything in the world. Genesis 8 and 22. Read it with me. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, that, it, it's going to be the same. And we think, well, yeah, that's for, you know, those with the farms, right? They, 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 it's, it's only the ones planting the big fields. So it's seed time and harvest. It's only in your garden. No, you're a garden. And there is seed time and harvest. It will not stop. It has to be that way. Number three, everything in the kingdom of God is done according to the principle of seed. We see that God created that way, he, it, to be that way. We see the earth is that way in this world. We also see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that you really can't see. It doesn't come with observation because it's within us when we receive this new heart. But it's with the seed. Mark 4, 26 through 29, Jesus said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow, and he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of itself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he puts forth the sickle because the harvest has come. The ground produces whatever seed is put into it. It's the seed that determines what will be produced, it's the ground that determines how it will be produced. It can be produced in an abundance. How? Well, you till the soil, you aerate it, you water, right? You pick the rocks, you pick the weeds out, and you're going to have a harvest of a, a, a glory crop, right? The big, just an incredible crop. But if you leave the rocks, you don't aerate it, you don't water it, and you let the weeds grow, your crop is going to be, it'll be the same seed, but the seed isn't going to produce that much. In fact, sometimes it won't produce enough to eat yourself. But God wants us to produce, not for us, He wants us to produce, He says, so we can give to every good work. You know what the Bible said? He wants a production in our life so everyone can find blessings. It just flows from us to bless, to bless, to bless. 
God isn't here to curse anybody. In fact, when he created Adam, he created him to bless and he didn't curse him. He said, Adam, you did this. And then even after all the world became corrupted and it was destroyed at Noah's time, uh, uh, what did he say? He, he, he said the exact same words to Noah after everyone's destroyed. The, the uh, Noah's Ark lands on the mount in Ararat and um, he, they come out, they give sacrifice and the Lord then blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Same thing he told to Adam. He said, he bl blessings, the same blessings. How can anyone curse who God has already blessed? He couldn't change his mind. He says, I'm not a man that I should change my mind. Here, we see if our hearts become if our hearts become callous toward God and more friendly and at, at home, you should say, with the things of this world, the less we'll produce of the blessings that God wants for us. It's just that way. When, you're, when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, we're, we, we're given a new heart. When we came into this world, we came with a heart that's dead. It was a heart, an inner man, but it was dead to God. We were living physically, but we were dead spiritually. And in Ezekiel 36, 24 through 27, it, the Bible says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Then, read it with me, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. In other words, a malleable heart, one that can be used by God, that can be used in the hand of God, we could say. The 27th verse says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Not by my great effort, by continually sowing seeds of his goodness into my heart. And that's going to come up. My actions will follow. Those that their actions aren't really following God, it's because of what's been sown into their hearts. And sometimes people give their life to Jesus, but don't really commit themselves to him. They pray a prayer. They say, okay, one day I can go to heaven, but uh, let me just stick with the world. And let me just, you know, do what I've been doing. You, you can't do that and change your life. So he's given us a new heart when we give our life to Jesus Christ. We can't do that. We're the only ones. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is in Christ, they become a new creation. Brand new creation, never existed before. A kenos, not a nuos, not reupholstered, redone, not an old jalopy that you, re, you, you, that you redid and, and, and made it look new. No, brand new, never existed before. A kenos. You became a new creation where old things pass away and all things become new. In fact, it says behold. It says old things pass away, behold. And the word behold means look and see. I'm to look and see not at the bad things to pass away. I'm to look and see at the new things that are becoming new. I'm to constantly look to the good, the new things. The, the good, better, best. Amen, our school motto. Good, better, best. I'll never rest until my good is better and my better is best. And that's giving our life over to Him and what we're doing. Whatever you find your hands to do, do it as under the Lord. Amen. Do it all your might. On February 24th, oh, see, you know, no, 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 this new heart, how does it come? How does this new heart come? First Peter 1.22, it's still the principle of the seed. All this is, aren't you seeing this? The principle of the seed. 
First Peter 1, 22-23, it says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Why? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible, by the Word of God which lives and abides forever. So the, it's the Word of God that is sown into our hearts. I'm so, I get to sow seeds into your hearts. When I did, uh, uh, um, when I was doing, I was on secular radio. Um, I didn't do Christian radio at the time. I just did secular radio. I thought that's where the people need to hear it the most. And it was called The Sower Sows the Word. And that was me. I was just sowing seeds into people's lives. Man, the effect it had. When the Word of God is sown in your heart, what is it going to bring up? Eternal life, right? There's where you get the new heart. It's from the Word. The but Read your Bible. Sow the Word into your life. Even you who have been born again and you have a new heart, get the Word into it because it will produce then this goodness that God has for you, the inheritance He has for you, the plans He has for your future. They'll all come to pass if you let the seeds be sown for them. Amen? And he says, these are my thoughts that I have for you. Thoughts of good, not evil. Thoughts of peace, hope, and a future. Amen? An expected end, one translation says. So when we get born again, it's not because of our great decision. It was because the seed started producing its fruit. And it just came up. And I responded to the fruit. Jesus, I give you my life. The fruit of what was sown into my heart came up. And they get a brand new heart and a brand new spirit, a new creation. Amen? Now, even for a plant to grow beyond what it is, if, like, say these plants here, there's none in soil, I don't think. Uh, so, but this right here, if these fake plants in the fake soil, if, if it had more fake soil, it could get fakier, right? <laughs> you... you you, when you put the plants in a bigger pot, when it, they can get called root-bound, right? Where it can't grow anymore. And you have to get it and then into a larger pot with more soil. So what is our requirement, you think, after we get this heart from God? Aren't we supposed to try to make it bigger? You do that by loving the unlovely, forgiving those that have offended, or not bringing them up, not talking about it. And he says, those people we're supposed to run away from. we got to love them, we got to forgive them, and we get a larger heart. Amen? And because of a larger heart, we can produce more. And that's what God is wanting from every one of us. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, on, on February 24th, 1948, uh, it was one of the most unusual operations that have ever taken place at Ohio State University Department of Research and Surgery. A 30-year-old man, his name was Henry Bashara, he was having surgery. See, 20 years earlier, um, he, him and a, a friend w w went out hunting. They had 22s, and his friend actually, the, his gun discharged, uh, you know, and uh, by mistake, and it pierced Henry in his left breast and lodged in its heart. And back then, that had been 1928, they couldn't operate on a heart. They'd have killed him. And so they, he was, he, they'd say, well, let's just leave it be and see what happens. And lo and behold, you know, he recovered well and he was living fine. Everything was going well, but 20 years later, found out he had no breath. He couldn't hardly do anything. He, he wasn't able to uh, 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 go to work anymore, couldn't play with his children anymore. Not that he lost the desire, he lost the ability. And so what they did, it, it, they, they said, now because of science and, and our understanding of, of the physical body and our abilities now that God has given us, we can, let's go in and see if we can do something. And when they opened up his chest, they found out that a lime deposit had built around his heart from that lead shell. And so 
because it built up around the heart, the heart couldn't grow anymore and had a hard time beating. It grew and it pushed out on that, but it restricted it. And because what was restricting his own heart was causing his life to get go digress and get worse and worse and worse. When they broke that that lime shell off, which they were very successful at, immediately his heart started pumping. It expanded right before their eyes when they got that shell off and, and it started beating. And afterwards he got up and, man, he, he says, I have full breath. I can look at the energy I have. Look at what I can do now. Well, there's a parable here. If our hearts become hard because of circumstances of life, that's what takes place. You let somebody irritate you, get to you, do something that you didn't like. Listen, everyone does something that somebody else isn't going to like. Get over it. But forgive them. You have to speak it out. I forgive them, Lord. I forgive you, whoever it is. Just go on. Humble yourself. When you do that, you, 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 you won't build up hardness around your heart and restrict your life. It'll, it'll, it'll open you up to get a larger heart, a bigger heart. Amen? It might hurt. Yeah, it might not be fun. It might not, you might not like it. You might have to swallow hard. But it is going to open up your life for a bigger heart. You'll have a greater heart for people. You'll have a greater heart for success. You'll have a bigger heart for, for advancement and growth and increase. And it's going to come out. Amen? Look at in Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. It says this, My son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. And we all know that, you know, incline means you're going to go uphill. So in other words, you know, listen to instruction, even though it's hard. You have to put some effort into it, put some shoulder in it, put some strength into getting up that hill. But keep listening, keep receiving instruction. Don't quit. My son, attend to my words and climb your ears to my sayings. He says, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them at where? In the midst of your heart. Read it with me. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of Life. Let me stop here. The, this word keep is the word um, not sir in, the, in Hebrew, and it means th this is to, to keep or to guard, to protect. It means to maintain. I, I have to be more concerned about my spiritual heart than anything else in this world. It's not a selfish thing. In fact, it's totally opposite. If I'm not willing to guard it, keep it, and maintain it, I'll quit, give up, and back away. I'll quit doing what God's asked of me. I'll stop being who he needs me to be. I'll quit blessing people. I'll start cursing them, saying bad things, rather than good things. Which let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Amen, Ephesians 4. Only that which is good to use to build up. Amen. Amen. Our heart. Read 23 again. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And then he goes on to say, how do I guard, keep, and, and, and maintain it? Read 24 and 25 uh, through 27 with me. Put away from you a perverse mouth, or don't be, don't be dishonest. And corrupt talk put far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. In other words, what about them? Remember with uh, um, John the Beloved, or J uh, you know, John? He, when, when Jesus rose again from the dead, you know, um, uh, D Jesus was, and Peter were uh, talking, and um, Peter said, you know, G because he, he denied Jesus and cussed him out, you know, publicly, Jesus wanted to go and talk with him, not to scold him. He didn't go there and just scold him. He said, just said, Peter, do you love me? He says, yeah. He says, well, then feed my lambs. And then he says, okay. Jesus says again, do you love me? Peter said, well, yeah, Jesus. And then feed my sheep. He said, well, Peter, do you really love me? 
He says, Jesus, you, you know all things. He says, well then, feed my sheep. He says, just feed them. He says, do what you're asked to do and keep doing it. Don't back away because he went fishing instead. Don't back away because of your heart, because of your problems, your emotional issues. Don't do this. He says, you know, when you're, when you're young, you're, you're, you're going to go around, you're going to pretty much where you want, what you're doing, but when you're older, other people are going to have to start carrying you and even help you dress. And Peter immediately points to John the Beloved, the one that leaned on Jesus' breast, and said, what about this man? And Jesus says, Peter, never mind about him. You take care of you. You. What about them? It's like children in school, you know. One, or, or even on a football field, now it's football time, you know, and you see somebody that, say, they, they, they sort of get into a spat out on the field and the flag is thrown and one person gets a penalty for, what's that called? Anyway, they're, they're not playing right, you know. No, just whatever, some kind of a penalty. And uh, where they're, you know, they're, they're, it means that they, they didn't act right. Unsportsmanlike conduct. And immediately that other, that guy is going to do, well, then pretty much say, what about him? Wrong response. Wrong response. Jesus says, no, let, let your eyes look straight on. Straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you. What you do is going to affect you. Other people have no bearing on it. Nothing. Zero. Zip. But if you get your eyes on them and, oh, get an attitude, oh, man, in the locker room, yeah, you know, they should have got that too. And what are they doing? They're sowing these seeds of, into their life that are going to produce more anger and hate and issues. They're going to make millions of dollars and lose them. Rather than making their finances and learning how to make that work for them and grow. And we see that all the time. That's why he says, let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. By the way, you know how much I know about football now. So, 26 verse. Read it with me. Ponder the path of your feet. Not somebody else's, your feet. And let all your ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or the left. Remove your foot from evil. Amen? Yes. Proverbs 4.23 in the Jewish Bible says, Above everything else, guard your heart, for it's the source of your life's consequences. And that's the truth. Having a right heart isn't going to guarantee you're not going to have problems. Everyone's going to have problems. But the outcome from the, after those problems can either be success, increase, promotion, wealth, or the outcome can be bitterness, worry, fear, less, in decrease, losing your job, losing your stuff. It's up to us. Amen? Because it's all on the principle of a seed. You've got to get this. Life is about seeds. In the natural, it's, ha it's bad to have a l enlarged heart. But in the spiritual realm, God wants us to grow a bigger heart. Because then we'll have more place for production, right? Better fruit, more fruit. Amen? You know, a lot of times Christians think, well... Now that I'm a Christian, I can just do whatever I want. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I, I, I don't know I'm too many people that really think that way, but there are, there are folks that do that. Well, I'd be like driving in the car, going 100 miles an hour, and uh, seeing a sign saying 90-degree uh, turn up ahead, 30 miles an hour, whatever, 25 miles an hour and thing, and you have the Christian station on, you're praying, you're singing to the Lord, you know, and just uh, enjoying yourself. And uh, so I don't have to slow down. Look at it, I'm worshiping God. I'm, I'm loving on Jesus. No, you're going to die, man. You're going to die. It has an effect. 
It has an effect. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're exempt from the hardships of problems. I can go through problems, but I don't have to have the hardships of them. I face, I face problems that you, I'd never wish on anybody. I mean, we have churches around the world. There's always something going on. Always some issues. I'm always with some government. Always, always some element of something. It doesn't have to have an adverse effect. That's what God wants from us. Amen? He wants us to have a relationship that even though there, that, that we have to work through things, there's no adverse effect. The adverse effect comes by the person that decides they're going to let the, something fester in them that shouldn't be in them. And that's why I told you here weeks ago, the strength of any relationship is always in the weakest person, not the strongest. It isn't the one that wants this relationship the most that's going to tell, determine the extent of the relationship. It's the person that wants the relationship the least that's going to determine the extent of the relationship. I want to do a lot of things helping folks, but it's up to them. A lot of times, boy, I want that man, I want that woman. It's not up to you. There has to be a mutual commitment, right? A mutual commitment. That's us with God, guys. There has to be a mutual commitment for you to get everything out of the relationship with God that he really wants to give you. He's not the one. It wasn't him that hid from Adam in the garden. It was Adam that hid from him. He said, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? He says, I'm hiding because I'm afraid. Who told you you're afraid? He allowed weakness to be sown into him. And it came up. In Psalms, the 119th chapter. L look at this. I love the 119th chapter, by the way, the longest chapter in the Bible. And uh, it is probably the greatest chapter in the Bible. Uh, it is wonderful. It talks so much about his word and God's word and, and, and the life that we get from it. But listen to what it says. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. In other words, all the good things I'm hearing about you, I'm clinging to it. All the good things. That's why testimonies are so important among us. The good things God's doing, right? Keep talking about the good things that God's doing for you. Get around people that only want to talk about the good things God's doing. Only be around them people. Remember what we read over here at Second Timothy? Don't be around the people that it's scorn. Don't do that. Be around people that with the good testimonies, the blessings, the greatness of God. Because that's going to sow the seeds that are going to bring up in your life what God actually wants from you. It's not by might, not by our power, not by our strength. It's by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So he says, For I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. Read it with me. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Amen? What a, what a incredible, incredible uh, um, bit of wisdom. It cause, it'll cause our lives to break forth. It'll cause our lives to just be open to let the blessings of God flow and His will be done. Amen? The, the cheetah is the fastest animal on the earth. The cheetah can run 70 miles an hour. But see, it has a little issue. If it doesn't catch its prey in the first one minute of the chase, it has to stop and quit. Why? Even though God built this animal with such a body that it can run 70 miles an hour. Man. He put a heart in it that was disproportionate to its body. It has a small, small heart. And it cannot produce the strength to run more that speed at more than a minute. Sometimes Christians take off in a flurry. Yeah, let's go after God. You know, let's do this. Let's do this. And nothing wrong with that. But when trouble comes, they don't understand how we're made, 
how we're supposed to produce this factory, how this factory works. And so they quit, back up and give up. They stop. They start licking their wounds. In fact, Jesus warned us about that, dogs that lick their own wounds. He said, people that live animal lives, not call them a dog. He's saying, but rather than living a kingdom life as a child of God, they revert back to nephesh, in the Hebrew, this animal life that just trample on the ground. They don't allow the ground to produce for them. And they just lick their own wounds. And this, what happens, this keeps the life of God from flowing from them and producing what Jesus really wants for us. He wants a better marriage than you want. Guaranteed. He wants, he wants a better, you to produce more and make more money than you do. That's not the point. We're not to be fixed on making the money or, 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 or uh, somehow, woman, you know, you've you got to change to make my life better or, or vice versa. No, it's, Lord, help me to build a bigger heart. What do I do? How do I do it? And in doing that, all of a sudden, things are going to really take place. When I first moved here to Merrill, I, uh, the Lord spoke to me. I said, you know, um, what do you want me to do? How, how, how do you want this done? And he quotes a poem to me called Requiem. I can't remember the author. I used to, th it's not Robert Louis Stevenson. I can't remember the author, but it goes like this. It says, they drew a circle that shut me out. Liar, rebel, a thing to shout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took them in. And he's saying, what I want you to do is no matter what, I want you to keep walking in love, keep drawing circles that'll take people in that you can help. And the ones that want help, wonderful. Teach them, show them how to grow, how to increase, how to prosper. And boy, it works. And that's been my motto, my life center with the Lord. No matter what anyone does, I'm going to just do what God wanted me to do. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, somebody shout amen. Help me preach this thing. There you go. Praise God. 2 Corinthians, are you getting something from this? We're about done here. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, it says, read it with me. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Now, when we lose heart, means we give up. We quit. Forget this. I don't have to take this. I could have probably said that a thousand times since I've been here. No, I don't have to. I get to. Just like giving. I don't have to. I get to. And if, if that's in our, my giving of finances, it's also in giving of my life. I don't have to. I get to. Because I know what God has in store. He says, therefore, read it, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's what I want to keep producing, eternal life. What God had in store, what his intentions are, what he needs. And man, it's beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. Ever. Amen. Giuseppe Garibaldi, an Italian military leader, he lived from 1807 to 1882. He was considered an Italian national hero. He personally led many military campaigns and brought about the formation of what's called the Unified Italy. Otherwise, it was like little different countries, these regions. He was dubbed the hero of two worlds in tribute to his military expositions in South America and in Europe. When appealing for recruits for his army, here's what he said, quote, I offer neither pay, nor quarters, nor provisions. I offer hunger, thirst, forced marches, battles, and death. Let him who loves his country with his heart and not with his lips only follow me. Boy, I'm not likening them to Jesus, but it sounds like Jesus. 
Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8 through 9, these people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It's our hearts that he wants. When you get born again, giving your life to the Lord, becoming a Christian isn't because I go to church. Just like if I go into the garage, it didn't make me a car. It's my heart. It's my heart given over to him. Jesus, only you. Letting him give me a new heart. And then, Lord, you have the instruction manual. Help me work with the heart you've given me. How do I make it bigger? How do I have it produce more? How do I build bigger heart treasures? How do I allow my life to change the way I see things in the world to just totally change to how you see them? How do I allow my, the relationships that I have uh, uh, have peace and, and, and unity? How do I allow you to come and bless people with signs and wonders and miracles? It's only by a spiritual gift. I'm not all that in a bag of chips, see. It's just continually, no matter what, Jesus, here's my life. Jesus told his followers, followers, remember, pick up your cross and follow me. Amen? We're going to have communion right now. Did you get something from this? So in order to have communion, we need to be Christians, right? We're going to have this commitment with the Lord. It's a little bit, we use a little bit of grape juice and a little piece of bread here. And it's, a, it's, it's a acknowledging a commitment of our lives to him. When Jesus was in the upper room, remember, he took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In other words, I'm committed to you guys. Totally committed. My, I'm giving my life for you. This is, my body's broken for you. Not him, for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and after he had uh, drank a little bit. He gave it to his disciples and said, here, drink all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. My body will be broken for you. My blood is shed for you. I'm, I'm, I will redeem you from the power of darkness and bring you into the kingdom of light. I'll translate you. I'll transform you. I'll redeem you, renew you, revive you, restore you. That's why he came. He didn't came to come to, to uh, belittle anybody. He didn't come to cuff you upside the head and say, Hey, straighten up, boy. He came to say, If you will give me your heart, watch what I'll do in you. Watch what I'll do in you. And so... We see the chapter before that in 1 Corinthians, you know, uh, in the 10th verse, uh, or in, in the 10th chapter, and um, uh, 14th verse, he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to wise men, judge what I say, the cup of blessing which we bless. That's where we, why we toast at marriages, by the way. Because of this practice in Christianity, we toast them. The cup of blessing which we bless. And we, we declare blessings upon their, their life at a meal. A covenant meal that was given. And he says, the bread which we break, is this not the communion of the body of Christ? To bless means I'm partaking of the blood of Jesus. Anything else, stay away from. Bless. Bless. Amen. Bless and curse not. And when we do, seeds are sown into our hearts. No matter what happened, no matter how things went, seeds get sown into our heart and it allows things to get produced. But I want to talk to you a little bit. Everyone that's listening now by radio, over the, through this camera here and the internet, wherever we are uh, around the world, 
What I want you to do is I want you to pray with me right now. Maybe you've known about Jesus, you've been to church, but you never really committed your life to him. Jesus says, unless you confess me publicly, I can't give you an audience before me, before the Father. I, I can't do it. Because it's a communion. We're communing with one another. And you have to humble yourself in order for your heart, that hardness, that deposit around it, the what's caused it to be dead and not grow, that it's the only thing that'll break that off. But when it's broken off, wow, what a life. How many remember the day you got born again? Greens were greener, blues were bluer. It was like, wow, this is incredible. What a life. So I want everyone in here and everyone watching now. I, I want you to pray with me. And if you mean it in your heart, and yet, as you confess it in your mouth, he says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The word saved there, by the way, is a Greek word, sozo, S-O-Z-O. What it means is blessed. You'll be saved. You'll be, it means healed, delivered, uh, made holy, uh, uh, you, be empowered, be enriched, uh, uh, prosperous, Every element of blessing, heavenly and earthly, that you could ever think. That's that word. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All the blessings are yours then. That's the only qualification. And as we continue then, give our hearts to God through faith and patience, all these inheritance, all, the, all this wonderful stuff in, from salvation, both spiritually, joy, peace, love, goodness, empowerments, and also wealth and health and, 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 and favor with man. And it all comes. But you need to start right now. So I want you right now, just you and God, but publicly, just confess it. Speak it out loud in your mouth. Say, God, forgive me. Come on, everyone in here. God, forgive me. I know that Jesus Christ died for me. He gave his life for me. And I know that he rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, I give you my life, my heart, my soul, my strength. I'm yours. Give me a new heart. Put your spirit in me. And let eternal life come up big time. In Jesus' mighty name, I'm now born again, a child of Almighty God. And I will work with the Lord to produce all the fruit I can to give Him the glory. And I'll receive joy in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise and honor. Thank you, Lord. You, I, it's pretty hard when you're holding some juice, right? But you can do this. If you prayed that prayer now and you meant it in your heart, lift up your hand right where you are. I don't care where you're watching. If you're going by on the highway, if you're in here, you meant it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so important. It's so important. Now, you need somebody to help you, though, and disciple you. Left to yourself, you'll screw things up, guaranteed, because you have an ungenerated mind. You need to be discipled. If you're out there, find a good church, a Bible-believing church, amen? And if you're here, man, we got some good folks that'll just help you and work with you. Otherwise, let's have communion now. That's what this is about right here. That's what all this is about. Jesus gave his body to be broken for us. Not him, us. He gave his blood to be shed for us, us. And when we receive it, we get all the benefits of it. 
So that means if you need healing in your body right now as we partake, healing is going to come into your body. You're going to see the Lord do incredible things right now. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. As we partake of this little token, this little piece of bread, we're declaring we're partaking of Christ, all he is and all that he has as the resurrected king. And so healing will fill our bodies. Prosperity will come into our homes. Goodness, joy, peace, love, mercy, faith will fill our lives, our families, so that we can bless others. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and partake of the bread. Jesus, we're told in Isaiah 53 and 5 that you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon your life. And by your stripes we have been healed. By the blood you shed, we're forgiven. You were scolded for us. We don't, we, we, we don't get scolded. We get loved. We get cared for. We get blessed. What a deal. There is no other covenant ever that could ever do what the covenant of your blood has done. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Praise the Lord.